This week on Thinking Biblically, we welcome back Bible scholar Dr. Ian Proven, who will be talking to us about the inspiration of Scripture, and somehow along the way we end up talking about blood pudding. Hello everyone, I'm Alan Gilman, and this is Thinking Biblically, a podcast dedicated to exploring how all Scripture speaks to all of life. Please don't forget to subscribe, share, comment, and review. This week, it's my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Ian Proven, who since 1997 has been the Marshall Shepherd Professor of Biblical Studies at Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. Dr. Proven was born and educated in the UK and holds a PhD from Cambridge. He has written numerous essays, articles, and books, some of them quite substantial, including commentaries on Lamentations, First and Second Kings, which I'm actually using as part of my personal study right now, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Daniel, as well as Seriously Dangerous Religion, What the Old Testament Really Says and Why It Matters, Discovering Genesis, and The Reformation and the Right Reading of Scripture, which is another one of his books I've been working through and the end is getting in sight. Uh, perhaps one day we may be able to discuss the contents of another book uh, we were talking about it earlier. We'll see if uh, Ian's willing to come back and discuss this with me because I think it's so needed, and that is Seeking What is Right, the Old Testament, and the Good Life. Dr. Proven and his wife Lynette have four children and three grandchildren. Welcome back to Thinking Biblically. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we're going to talk about something, but first, as a, as a kind of a springboard to this, um, this is my main uh, hard copy version of the Bible. I have to admit that much of my Bible reading is online, whether it's an uh, app on my phone or on my computer. Uh, one day, I'll see if we have to repent for such things. But this is a genuine leather ESV. It's got maps. It has a table of weights and measures. It doesn't have cross references, but of course it's got all the footnotes and the headings and and two kinds of tables of contents. We've got the Bible in order and and the alphabetical table of contents. And um, so I have a question about my Bible, Ian. Is this the Word of God? You're asking that question? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, it is the Word of God, and I think that we must receive it in this way because I believe that our Lord himself gave us the scriptures that, that, that he already knew about to be received by us, and I think he authorized his apostles to go and do more. And so I, I think we're obliged by the terms of our Christian discipleship to receive it in this way. So I please understand my heart in asking, but um, you don't mean the maps too, do you? Oh, I see. Well, no, the maps are helpful commentary. And, you know, there is a bit of an issue, and it's more pronounced with study Bibles, I think, that as helpful as they can be for folks, putting stuff in the same volume between the covers, as it were, I think can sometimes suggest to, to readers that it's all you know, in the Bible, as it, as it were. And um, <clears throat> so there is a bit of a downside, uh, I think, to that, that we can get confused. Because there's also the head, and there's the headings. Yes, there are. And we have to recognize that every translation is also, to some extent, interpretation. And um, editors, you know, who translate the Bible into English, for example, make decisions sometimes about, that kind of thing designed to help. And of course, it very often does help readers, but the difficulty is that not everything they do is beyond um, discussion. Um, are, so. you a, are you a fan of, this is very controversial, very emotional, are you a fan of red leather editions? Red letter editions? Uh, not really, no. Again, that's making a very strong suggestion of some kind, it seems to me, that you know somehow these are more important or the only things that matter. And perhaps the people who wrote them in red didn't mean that, but you know, you do get Bibles now that are, are very focused on the interests of the person who produced them. 
I believe you get green letter ones now as well. I've been told, I've never seen one, where I think the theme that's being emphasized is ecology, environment, and so on. And Well, there know, have been these much- highlighted. There's these Bibles in the past I haven't seen in a while where all, all sorts of themes are, are color-coded. Yeah, and all of that is a suggesting to the reader, subliminally, if, <laughs> uh, maybe even accidentally, that these things are... This is how you ought to read. These are the these are the important things to pay attention to, and I I just think it's wiser to keep the commentary and the suggestions separate from the text, so that we know what we're dealing with. And I suppose that would be a controversial statement, not least because I myself have contributed to study Bibles before. But I do I do worry a little bit about the implications of of that mixing. Yeah. So I, I teach uh, a Bible class to grades five through eight um, at a, a private Christian school here in Ottawa, and uh, it was a seven eight class, and we were talking about a particular subject, and children were allowed to bring whatever Bible they and their their parents deemed fit, and uh, one of the students had a study Bible, and uh, in a conversation. Uh, the student pointed at the study notes and said, well, in my Bible, it says. Yeah, yeah. And that, so that's would be extreme, but um, we should be careful because we need to be aware that there, there weren't the same kinds of breaks even, and there wasn't punctuation in the original. And so a lot of those things are actually interpretive. Now, a lot of Bibles, uh, the scholarship is very, very good, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I mean, the problem lies not necessarily in the scholarship. It lies in the the style um, that people are trying to produce. So some um, translations tend to paraphrase more. Uh, They make choice over choices about the importance of meaning over against word-for-word accuracy in terms of communication in the vernacular. Um, And these things are not right or wrong. It's just wise to be aware of the kind of thing that you're dealing with. One of the problems, though, of the sort that you've just described, Alan, is that um, if if a student then discovers that there's a question to be raised about this, it can spill over into, oh, I, now I can't trust my Bible because you're telling me that that bit's not in the Bible. So which other bits are not in? And so this is just an area where we need a lot of education in the church, um, just to so that people understand the basics of what we're dealing with in translations, study Bibles. That and we're ta- when we talk about the bits, so what, what I was trying to encourage the, the, the students is to know there's a difference between the commentary that was added <clears throat> by the producers of that particular Bible translation or v- version <clears throat> um, at, as opposed to the text itself. And that goes to, um, you know, many people don't even realize that the, the chapter breaks and even the, many of the verse breaks. And of course, all the, the, the chapter numbers and things have, were added way, way, way after the, the text was complete. Yes. And sometimes even the headings that, that some translators put in, you know, sometimes I think they're actually not helping because they're breaking up. The text and so people in their minds are thinking well that bit of the story ends there then but actually it obscures the fact that there's a very important continuation coming up um so these are not insurmountable problems of any kind they just require that everyone gets good bible education at, at, um, at at least a rudimentary level so that we can all we can all function properly I want to put a plug in for the headings. There's two kinds of headings in the Psalms that a, you know, a lot of English readers of the Bible or readers of English Bibles don't aren't aware because those little introductory things where it says a Psalm of David mm. is actually part of the ancient text. Those mm. aren't headings that were added after, but in English, um, I believe because it's based on the, the way the Septuagint lays it out, is that right? That they they push the those little introductory comments prior to verse one, Mm -hmm. and then the English reader thinks, well, that that's not important, and then starts the psalm at where the little one is in their text. 
Well, that's right. And if you read some of the more, um, what shall we say, the, the more detailed modern scholarly commentaries, you'll see that they often give you both verse numberings just so that the person reading that commentary can work out that in the Hebrew text, that's actually verse one, that heading. Mm -hmm. And so you're always at least one verse out. Um, on the other hand, the headings you often find, book one, book two, book three, and so on, those are modern insertions into the into the Psalms. They're not inaccurate. Right. They are a, an accurate representation of the organization of the book, I believe, but they're not physically present in, in Hebrew manuscripts. So. Right, and what, what uh, Ian's referring to here is, if you look in most modern translations, in the Psalms, it's, it's sectioned into five sections, and you'll see it says book one, mm -hmm. and there's reasons to believe that there are those major breaks, as Ian was saying. Um, so we're here to talk about the topic of inspiration and uh, the inspiration of Scripture, and I'm, I'm going to get your definition in a moment. We're almost there, um, and I might be asking this out of order, I'll let you decide. So there's a controversy uh, among believers, people who take the Bible seriously, uh, the idea that the scriptures are the word of God versus the scriptures contain the word of God. Mm. Would it be helpful to explain that uh, first and then define inspiration or would you rather define inspiration first? I don't mind which way we come at it. I mean, this question can be quite an important one, depending what people want to do with that distinction. I think the reason that people are suspicious of the language of the Bible containing the Word of God is that it appears to suggest that at least parts of the Bible aren't the Word of God, that they're only part of the container, <laughs> as it were. And that, I think, is problematic. Uh, and of course, it puts the, the reader or the group of readers in control of determining which parts are the Word of God and which aren't. And in the end, that surely must under, undermine the authority of Scripture. Um, so on, in that debate, I'm very much on the side of the, the folks who believe we should speak about um, the Bible being the Word of God. Um, uh, now, if you want to take me back to the definition, no, that's fine. You, can, <laughs> but that's that's um, starting there. Up not to a bad you. Place Up to, to you. Start. No, it's okay. Um, so, what do we mean by the inspiration of Scripture? Well, we mean that God breathed out Scripture, right? So, this is really the language of Second Timothy three sixteen, which is a a very important text in terms of the nature of the thing that we're dealing with in the Bible. So all scripture is inspired, God breathed, and so on. And so even though it is manifestly produced by human authors, and we can get to this, nonetheless, at the same time, uh, what we have at the end of that process and what we have in the midst of that process taking place is God choosing to speak through these words gathered together? Um, so uh, we, the church accepts Scripture as words from God about what we should believe and how we should live. Okay, so what do we do when we, when we talk about the Scripture is the Word of God? We start off, you know, here I'm holding my Bible and this is the word of God, and which I do believe, but also I think it's helpful for people to understand a little more about what that actually means or how it actually works. Um, so, so of course, there's notes in this, in the, in this study Bible, the maps, um, the headings, that's, that's, that's not the word of God, there's the text itself. But what do we do with something like the words of Job's friends, or the words of, of Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. So when, when Satan says, turn these stones to bread, am I quoting, if I, when I quote that, am I quoting the word of God? Well, these are, we're now at the beginnings of a very important conversation, which is the one that I believe you would like us to have. <laughs> and that is having agreed together that we're dealing with inspired with inspired text. 
what does that mean in practice for how we read it, right? And clearly, there are things that people say in the Bible that are not true or are not entirely true. In the case of Job's friends, you know, they, they have a very significant misunderstanding at the heart of their whole interaction with, with Job. And so when Satan quotes scripture, he's doing so fundamentally in a wrong-headed way, uh, a way that is not appropriate. Um, and so we do have to be able to distinguish what people in the narrative say um, and what God is saying to us through the same narratives. And part of what God is saying to us is don't read scripture like that, um, right? Don't, don't read it like those people, Job's friends or Satan in particular, don't do that. So that's part of God's word to us. So we can't just in some very wooden way go from the word on the page to the word of God. That would lead us into very obvious areas of error and contradiction if we did that. So that, that takes us to the whole, the, the concern about narrative and understanding how to read the Bible, right? Um, but I get, you know, I get the impression that, um, okay, well, back to the ins inspiration itself, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about how inspiration works so that that might help us too in understanding better how to how to hear God in, in His Word because I I think a lot of people think you know didn't God just speak to people and they wrote it down and perhaps you can, we can go back to Second Timothy three you know what does it mean that God breathed um, I have it here all scriptures breathed out by God this is the English Standard Version mm -hmm. breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof for correction for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work mm -hmm. so do you, do you want to talk about that you know a lot of people I think still think that inspiration means dictation Yes, I mean, that has been a view held by Christians all the way through the history of the church. And um, you certainly find um, Christian writers sometimes writing in that very direct way, um, as if that were all that was going on. But the thing about this is that as you actually read scripture, um, you gain the impression that actually we're dealing with very different kinds of writing from very different periods in very different styles. And so although God is speaking through John's gospel, for example, uh, John is also speaking in his own voice, which is why John is so different from Mark. If it were a simple matter of dictation, um, like a, you know somebody who runs a company dictating a letter, to a secretary, um, you would not expect there to be very much difference in the way in which that occurs, right? Because the, the governing voice there is, is utterly governing. There's no room for creativity, right? I think if a, a secretary exercised too much creativity, that would be a very short-lived employment opportunity because that's not the purpose of it. So. Um, it seems to me that one of the important things to recognize about Scripture is that God has worked with the circumstances, the author, the personality of the author, the literary conventions of the time, and so on, and that it's not simply a matter of dictation as we normally think of dictation. Well, isn't there some dictation? Did not God dictate to Moses what to say? Well, certainly the Ten Commandments um, probably are the most obvious part of Scripture where that God is God wrote that with his finger. Well, there you go. So, of course, there are places where that is true, but I don't think we could, can or should generalize from that um, because I, I think otherwise it becomes very, very difficult to understand the four Gospels, for example. As to, yeah. I, I didn't, I did, 
I didn't bring up the Moses thing to give the impression that the same thing happened with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for example, mm -hmm. or Paul's mm -hmm. letters, um, mm -hmm. or the Psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have occasions when God clearly in some way says to the whoever is the, mm -hmm. the vessel of communication that this is exactly what to say. And it seems yes, with Moses true. that is, that may, that may not be case all the time. I, I think we read in Deuteronomy, the way Deuteronomy is written is seems to be a recounting. Well, perhaps Leviticus is more along the line of dictation. It, you know, I, I don't know if we can know for sure. No, we can't know for sure, but you're quite right. I mean, there are, there are places in Scripture where the dictation idea fits better than in other places. The problem comes when we generalize from one type of thing and make it apply to everything else, even though the evidence on the ground in these other places suggests that that's not um, what's actually happening. Um, right. So, so let's. So going back yeah. to the Gospels, um, which were not dictated, they're written as similar to how people write histories or biographies today. I know it, the dynamics very different. Uh, but these are compositions by these uh, by these individuals. Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, appear to be sharing some of the same sources, and scholars discuss that. Um, but how do we know uh, that these writers aren't getting in the way of what God is breathing out? God is in, or God is inspiring through them. How do we know that that um, there isn't a little too much of Matthew and Matthew's writing that obscures what God really wants to say to us? Well, there's not a definitive answer to the question of how we know that. <laughs> uh, in order to know that, we'd have to have some third party stance outside everything that we're talking about to make some godlike judgment on the oh, whole thing. Can, and we don't. Can, can have... I find that person, bring them on the show? <laughs> yeah, no, you can't, I'm afraid. You're stuck with me. I, <laughs> I am a much more limited uh, individual. Um, so, of course, this brings the question up, really, the general question of how we know anything. What do we mean when we say we know stuff? And I think the, the, the central answer to that question is that we know what we think we know because we've trusted other people when they've told us these things. And then we've maybe tested them for ourselves. But most of what we know or we think we know, we've actually never tested, actually. And so the question is really, uh, whom do we trust? That, that's what it comes down to. And I think that Scripture itself will, will tell us that Jesus put his stamp of authority on the Old Testament scriptures, that he made provision for the apostles to go further in leading people into all truth, and that we um, have our fundamental confidence in scripture because we are given it by Christ himself for our lives. So it's not a matter of independent verification or some standing outside the whole process. It's a question of do we have grounds to trust? Um, the central person in the story when when he says these things. It's a it's a bit of a I like to call it a, a funny thing to uh, explain how on one hand there's a very subjective element in that you can't it's difficult to know for certain that we're interacting with the Word of God until we ourselves interact with the Word of God. So that sounds very experiential and subjective. But there's also the fact that so many other people have done the same thing, and not only have they come to the same conclusions, one of the things that I delight about interacting with, with who we believe is the true God and His Word is that how people have encountered these truths have, have had such variety. It's not like follow these three steps, read read these three chapters, and you will be convinced. There's just so much to how the scripture, if I could personify it in a way, engages us. And if we allow ourselves to do it, then it it does speak on its own terms. Yes, and there there's a family resemblance um, among all of these folks as they read. So they may not be reading necessarily in precisely the same way, but 
there's a recognition that it's within the bounds of the same, you know, family kind of uh, group and so on. The only thing I would say about that is that um, it's not necessarily always true yet that we experience what the Word of God is saying. And, and so there's, there is that sense of growing into things. And um, it's, it's just because something, in other words, just because something doesn't make sense of my experience now, doesn't mean that it's not the word of God. And this is the danger of the language of containing, because I think all too often, if we feel we have the authority just to make a judgment on this, as it were, then we end up rejecting things on the dubious basis that we uh, apparently know all things and can make that judgment now. So although experience is in the end a very important part of proving the word of God to be true. Um, I think we have to be careful not to put ourselves above the word of God in doing that, even accidentally. Uh, as I was preparing for our time together, I came up with a, a biblical illustration to, um, to illustrate how inspiration works. Could I bounce it off of you? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it relates a lot to this, uh, you know, the, the Bible as literature and its relationship to inspiration. And so God moves upon the person to write, to write without necessarily dictating the very words. Mm -hmm. So whether it be the Psalms and David has a burden and expressed this way, and then it's preserved for us because it's not just for David's own personal thing. It's, it, it's God's in a sense, not, it's not speaking to everyone the same way, but it speaks to everyone. Mm -hmm. So when God inspired Noah to build the ark, he provided him with an expert naval design. Right? He didn't, he could have created a magic boat, or maybe he couldn't, because I don't know if God, God works that way. But he actually, he inspired him, and in this case, from what we could tell in Genesis, he gave him these dimensions. He gave, he, so he gave him the plans of how to build this. But the inspiration to do this included what turned out to be, as far as I can tell, how you would build a huge boat. And so wouldn't God reveal himself within brilliant story structure? Well, I think that's largely what God does. I mean, I think the whole of Scripture is um, a story in which are embedded all sorts of other genres, other types of literature. Um, and I, I think this this um, th this is a very important theological point. It's got to do with how God has chosen to interact with the world generally, not just with the question of inspiration. Um, in, in creating human beings to, to do and to be what they're supposed to do and be in Genesis, I think it's fairly clear that they are given huge latitude in the world in terms of ruling and having dominion and carrying things on on behalf of God. And there, there's a very important sense in which God is giving creation permission to be, as it were, and permission to, to go on. and um, not micromanaging, if I can put it in modern language, choosing not to do so. So I, I don't know whether we can pronounce on what God can or cannot do with respect to magical boats, but I think we have a lot of evidence from Scripture and life as to what it is that God has chosen not to do in order for the world to be this kind of world and not some other kind of world. And in this kind of world, uh, God has given humanity huge scope for creativity, for, you know, for all sorts of things. And that includes the writing of literature. And however we imagine inspiration working, and it's very dif difficult for us to imagine, uh, I think it, at every point where God interacts with the world, it's a paradox from our point of view. We don't really understand it entirely. But I, I certainly think we can say about it that the inspiration is true, but it does not represent micromanaging. And that is consistent with the whole biblical story. So the doctrine of inspiration is only one example, if you like, of the way that God has chosen to create 
and providentially to oversee the world. Uh, and none of that is micromanaging, if you think about it. Um, so, yeah. Right. So I imagine my micromanaging would take us back to dictation and overriding yeah. the will of, of the person, putting them into a trance, and they, they simply deliver what they got, which again does seem to happen from time to time. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, examples of that in scripture, but by and large, we have story. We have, mm -hmm. we have letters. Um, uh, but going, going back to my, uh, my Noah's Ark illustration, uh, do you think that the honing of the stories the, um, is also something that was overseen by God, or is it just something that he left with the person to do? And so that we would say, um, David was a master songwriter, or is it both? I think it's both. I don't want to choose between those, honestly, because I, I think that there are problems with both of the choices there. I think that God providentially oversees everything going on in the world. It's not that God is somewhere else, as it were, right? Uh, God is here with us. God is fundamentally involved in the whole process, the ongoing process of creation and redemption and all of that. And yet within that, there is such a thing as moral freedom for, for human beings and for angels, it turns out as well. Um, there is huge scope for decision making, for creativity, for writing. And all of that is bound up together in a way that we cannot understand, but that we have good reason to believe. Uh, one of my favorite examples of the general case is the story of Joseph where the brothers, of course, do some very nasty stuff to Joseph, and God allows it. God is not, has, is, has not gone somewhere else, but God has created the world in which brothers can be mean to each other, very, very mean to each other. But at the end of the story, you may remember, Joseph on two occasions says something like this, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So there's an actual evil doing turned to good under the providential care. Now, we're not talking about evil doing in the writing of scripture, but I, I think that this is one of those areas where we can recognize what we shouldn't say about the issue. Uh, and then we get stuck about what we can say because it's paradoxical and mysterious. But then I, I think that whenever God interacts with creation, you would expect it to be paradoxical and mysterious. That's not very surprising, um, I don't think. Okay, that, that you know, talking about uh, the Joseph story, which is one of my favorites in terms of the workings of God and, and, and Joseph's amazing statement to his brothers at the end, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I think that's so mind-blowing. And I, I'd rather leave it sometimes in a mind-blowing place mm -hmm. rather than figuring it out. We, I think we can live it better than we can explain it. And it's certainly a wonderful example of the, the genius of Scripture inspired by God. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you alluded to this already. So we don't, when we deal with the Joseph story, we see God's providential hand at work and clearly, we're to be a lot more like Joseph than we're to be like his brothers. You know, God's using the brother's evil is no uh, justification to do what they did because we might say, well, God's going to work it out in the end. Mm -hmm. Obviously not. And it seems to me there are some people that are, are doing this sort of thing with Scripture, and I've heard this for decades, actually, uh, where, oh, here is Paul like here's Paul acting or speaking like his former life. Here is Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, and now the reader, the scholar, the writer is deciding which parts of Bible are truly inspired, which are right and which are wrong, which is not the same thing as going and understanding why Job's friends, even when they say things that appear to be right in one sense, are actually saying things that are very wrong. And, and you have to dive into that book to fully understand it. Clearly, we know that, that Satan's words were not from God when speaking to, uh, to Jesus, or when Peter rebuked Jesus when he said he was going to have to die. Those were not the words of God. 
but we we learn from God as we as we examine these interactions. Yeah. That all said, there are other things that, as I just mentioned, people think we're supposed to go and 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 find. You know, these are the 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 humanly derived parts. These are the inspired parts. Now, I don't think you believe that. How no. how how do we what do we do with no. this? Because uh, am I we, right? In, have you encountered this as a real thing going on? Yes, I recognize everything um, you've just been saying. I, I don't think we we should go around saying this is the word of God and this is not. I do think it's very important to ask the question, yes, what is the word of God actually saying, though? Now, in these cases of Job's friends, you have to read to the end of the book, I think. And then you have a context for the individual words of the friends all the way through. In the Gospels, we are told about the significance of Satan's words and Peter's words. And so it's not the individual words um, in the sentences alone that, that matter here. And like all literature, it's the context, it's the larger situation. Uh, in the end, the reason the reformers used to talk about Scripture interpreting Scripture is the bigger idea that in the end, what sentences and paragraphs mean depends on what they mean in the context of the whole story. Um, and this then helps us to work out the business of whom we should imitate and, and whom we should not. Um, I would think that there are more negative examples in Scripture than there are positive ones. There are more warning signs. Don't be like that. Don't do that. Don't say that kind of thing. Um, I think there are more. There are at least as many. And one of the problems with reading, um, with thinking of this inspiration thing in too wooden a way is that we can end up imitating people we shouldn't be imitating. Um, I, I call this her heroic reading. It's, the idea behind it is almost, um, it's, it's the Holy Bible, therefore everyone in it must be holy. Uh, like well, Samson? <laughs> well, like Samson's a great example. Well, obviously... I think, obviously, that's not true. There, there are some very murky characters and some dreadful things that are done by all sorts of people. It's all the word of God, but it's not all trying to say the same thing. Some of it's being presented for imitation. A lot of it's being presented by way of opposition. Quite a bit of it is not immediately, obviously, one thing or the other, and you really have to think about it. So what are we supposed to do with Jephthah? for example. Are we supposed to imitate Jephthah in keeping his promise? Keeping promises is generally a good thing to do. But should he have kept that promise? That's, that's a question. That's the promise that uh, the first thing to walk, to see right. I'm going to sacrifice and, and uh, if God does yeah. thus and so, and it mm -hmm. ends up being his daughter. Right. So there, there's, there's a dilemma for the reader, and you have to think that through. So on the basis of what else Scripture teaches us, how are we supposed to think of Jephthah? Because not every thing in, in biblical narrative is is immediately clear. Right. So uh, talking about like this heroic reading, it's similar to this uh, kind of um, overly straightforward reading and reading the Bible as if it's like Aesop's fables and uh, everything could be reduced to a moral when actually mm -hmm. there's confusing stories that we need to grapple with. Yes, I mean, I, I think much of Scripture is fairly clear immediately, and then we have to read the things which are not quite so clear immediately in that context. And that also is a very old rule. St. Augustine already is advising readers to read the obscure in the context of what is clear. And, and from the early church fathers onwards, Augustine right through people like uh, Calvin and Luther, um, all of these great Christian writers understand this, this business we've been talking about, that human authors are doing ordinary human things in their writing in the midst of God speaking to the church through Scripture. Um, and then bad reading is equally part of the tradition. I mean, my favorite example of bad reading at the moment is uh, St. Ambrose, who wrote a book on Jacob, 
in which he suggested that Jacob was blessed because he was wise. You know, he, he, he portrays Jacob almost as an early Stoic, a Greek philosopher, you know. And you read the Jacob story, of course, and you think, what? <laughs> that, that doesn't seem right. Jacob is a, is a, is a rogue. He's a cheat. He, he's a, a very problematic character for much of his story. Um, so the heroic reading thing, I, I think, I, I, of, do, I don't know if we yeah. talked about this last time. I think he has a certain element to him. Um, and I don't know, you know, full disclosure coming from a Jewish background, I get a little nervous when people really go after Jacob. And I, I accept that, uh, he, he and his mom, like the two of them do some real underhanded things. I still can't figure out how Isaac thought that he was Esau uh, as he was <laughs> layered with yeah. these goat skins. And oh, it sounds like Jacob, but it feels like Esau. Um, and, and, and by the way, kind of making fun, but I think it's part of the delight of scripture and this, this, this book that God inspired that we can grapple with some of these things. But mm. here's how I handle some of what Jacob is. Jacob, without fully understanding, his heart was for the things of God, while his brother Esau, he was like a man of the earth, like he was driven by his tummy. You know, my stuff, you know, I'm famished, I'm gonna die, he'll do anything for that. And yet Jacob had his eye on these higher things. Do you think I'm just, what do you think? Um, I'm not, I'm not opposed to that idea, Alan. I mean, I, I certainly don't think Esau comes off better, <laughs> quite, quite the contrary. But I think we ought to be able, and I think the text is inviting us to see that Jacob, at least in the first part of his story, is a deeply problematic person. I mean, yes, I mean, maybe he does have a glimmering of of who God is, but I mean, even at Bethel, he's doing deals with the Almighty, really, you know, if, if you, you know, look after me properly, I'll, you know, worship you in the future. And it's a bit calculating. He's a bit of a, a wheeler dealer kind. And the whole family is, is like that. Rebecca's like that. Laban is like that. I mean, you know, cheating is part of the, the family kind of reality. So I think we also have to give weight to that. And my point is, it's okay to give weight that we're not being, we're not treating scripture disrespectfully when we pay attention to what it is apparently trying to say to us. Um, a, a kind of very wooden idea of inspiration might make people nervous about that. But actually, if we, if we believe scripture is, God is speaking to us in scripture, then attending to what the text appears really to want to say is fundamentally uh, important. So let's, uh, if we can, talk about this idea that uh, we should or could disregard certain elements of scripture because they're uh, culturally bound. Now, maybe in the future we'll talk about the Old Testament in particular. I think you and I are on the same page that there's so much there to mine that was good for the people of Israel back then and is good for everyone today. And it'd be good to talk about how do we know what elements of uh, what Moses taught is universal and what was mm. particularly to the people of that day. But what do we do without necessarily naming some of these? We're reading Paul's letters and some people say, you know, thank you, Paul, but that only worked for your day. That doesn't apply to our day. And so we don't have to do that. So yeah. without, unless you want to get into specifics, just as a general principle of Bible study, what do we do with this idea? Well, no, but that that's culturally bound. That was for them. It's not for us. So much yeah, for information. So, so I would say, without getting into specifics, I would say that there's a great difference between, number one, coming to the conclusion that certain things that God said to Moses are not applicable to the church and coming to that view because scripture itself can be seen to teach it, right? That's, that's making an internal discernment, right? So Christians no longer circumcise young male children, for example. That's, you know, that's something that 
um, is part of the scriptural story. We're making an assessment about that within those bounds. That's number one. The position number two, though, is very different. Position number two is we enlightened people who have made such progress in the world and have come somehow independently to know what is true and right are now sitting in judgment on the Apostle Paul. And for that reason alone, saying we're not going to pay attention to the Apostle Paul. That is fundamentally problematic because that's rejecting apostolic authority, it seems to me. And that is that is not a trivial difference between those two positions. That's really a very big one, right? Because what we're doing then is saying, I simply prefer my moral sentiments or whatever, and I don't really like the Apostle Paul, so I'm just going to ignore what he's got to say, uh, even though there's no reason to think that that uh, what what he's got to say there is is somehow irrelevant. Um, so you know, I, we've we've been through this cyclically, and within the Bible itself, we see it cyclically: people just overthrowing the commands of God because they don't really like them very much. Uh, and we're going through another phase uh, of it now, and. Um, focused now on the question of anthropology. What is a human being? What is our identity? What does all of that mean for how we handle our lives, including our sexual lives? Um, This is our version of the the conversation. So, Yeah, we could at some point to get into some of the details. One of the details, going back to the Old Testament, and I don't think we're going to talk about it here, just uh, I don't know if we would differ, because uh, it took me a while to understand uh, the ongoing nature of the Abrahamic covenant for Jewish believers. And so I, I do believe that uh, the covenant of circumcision still stands and that the for Jewish believers, but mm. not for non-Jews. Mm. Um, should Christians eat blood pudding? Um, I mean, <laughs> if Christians want to eat, blood pudding. I don't see any clear prohibition against it, I suppose is what I would what, say. Acts 15, I, Acts 15 doesn't say no? I don't, I don't think that in the whole scope of the New Testament added to the Old that it necessarily says no. I mean, Acts 15 is a moment in time, right? Uh, it's almost like while we think about this further, <laughs> we're going to we're going to have these provisional rules, and so a lot depends here on how you fit that into the to the whole story. Um, so how and, is that uh, not culturally bound? And I do I believe there are there are certainly but whether it's Old Testament, I believe there's mm-hmm. things that I do believe there's things that Paul says that were for that particular community he was writing to. How yes. to determine when that is is not easy. Um, right. Because he doesn't add study notes like we were talking about no. earlier. Um, we're, yeah. We read Paul's letters, we're reading over his shoulder of what he's saying to particular people at a particular time, but there's so much there that is for everyone. And I think we'd agree it's not 100%, but I think it's not as, uh, as little as some people are trying to make it today. Um, and I know we could talk about the meat sacrifice to idols as one of the things because Paul then comments on that. And I, I think his, I, I, on one hand, I think it's straightforward enough, but it's it's complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but doesn't the blood go all the way back to Noah? And right. it's before the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. And, and then it's brought forward and as uh, Jewish believers are having issues with what non-Jewish believers are doing in the early days of the new Christian community, is not the, the forbidding of eating blood reconnecting or, or commanding that which God had already commanded to the whole human race? Possibly, but there's the question of the ongoingness of the story, not just the part that the Sinai covenant plays in that, for example. And Noah is, of course, um, the question there, to, to back off and to avoid questions of blood pudding, just to, to, to go more generally, <laughs> The, the, the question in these cases is, what is the creation command of God, right? What, what, is, what is grounded in creation? Um, these things truly are always and everywhere to be obeyed. And the question, even with regard to 
the early chapters of Genesis after the creation account is how do we think about that in relation to that bigger question? And of course, um, even Christians committed to reading the Bible and not just being kind of um, uh, modern people who don't like ancient stuff, even Christians who really are committed to working this out within scriptural bounds, historically have disagreed a little bit on some of these issues. And that, that I think is okay because there's a common quest that is producing slight, small disagreements, I would say. I'm not sure these are major. And you and I might well disagree, therefore, for all I know, once we got into it, on the, the status of the Abraham covenant, for example, for, for Jewish believers. Um, we, we might or we might not. I don't know how that would go. The important thing is, what's the right way of approaching it, though, right? And I think that the fundamental thing here is, what are really the creation commands of God that don't change through time? And what are other ones that are more contextual? And I agree with you. I think the apostles do sometimes um, say things to individual churches that are more to do with their immediate environment than, than with anything else. But I do think we have to handle this kind of issue very carefully because we are all ourselves a bundle of desires and agendas and stuff like that. And we have to be very careful to not to put ourselves over scripture. So it's an important matter, right? So we've got to handle it really carefully and to devise rules that protect scripture from ourselves, if I can put it that way. Um, okay. Um, so we're, we're just about done. How about, could you leave us with, what the Bible means to you. When you open up the Word of God, uh, the written Word of God for your own personal life, what does that mean to you? Well, it's fundamental to me, Alan. I mean, I, I wouldn't know what to do with myself, as it were, without Scripture. <laughs> um, and it's been that way since I was a teenager, when I first um, really uh, had a a personal, a more personal interaction with, with God, having been brought up in the church. And suddenly I discovered that Scripture had come to life in a new way for me because the Apostle Paul was no longer talking about somebody else, as it were. He was, I could recognize that he was talking about me. So there was a, a, a visceral experiential aspect of the kind that you mentioned early on where you suddenly thought, gosh, you know, this is actually not just ancient stuff. It's actually about now. And so from that moment until this, imperfectly and in all sorts of confused ways and making terrible mistakes along the way, I have um, sought to build my life on the foundation of what Scripture teaches. And I I don't know of any other foundation that's more secure. In fact, I think a lot of the foundations that our contemporary culture is seeking to, to build life upon are very fragile indeed, and um, perhaps are becoming evidently more fragile. So for me, this is absolutely fundamentally existentially uh, important. Um, Alistair McIntyre, the philosopher, has a very good paragraph in his book, After Virtue, in which he writes, and I'm summarizing and you know, paraphrasing a little bit, that you, you, only, you can only know what to do next in life when you know which story you're a part of. And that, I think, is absolutely right. And he says, he's not making a theological point particularly there. He, he talks about if you deprive children of stories, you basically incapacitate them from living life. And I, I think the general point applies here very clearly, too, that you need to know which story you're a part of in order to know what to believe about stuff and what to do next. And um, so when we talk about canon of Scripture, the, the word canon is simply a Greek word meaning a measuring line. Scripture is what I measure my beliefs and my actions against, and I can't imagine what I would 
how I could even function actually at this point in my life without without scripture. So, so uh, blood pudding or no blood pudding, I completely agree with you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and what you're sharing too about you know what story you're really a part of, and that's what the Bible actually gives us. And and sadly, you know, while there are particular details that are important to know and 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 um, directives that God gives us, there is this holistic aspect to Scripture that it this very uh, a book of such great variety uh, is actually so cohesive in how it reflects God and life and people in all of its complexity and all of our complexity. And uh, I really appreciate you spending this time with me and and uh, how graciously you handled some of my questions. Um, and so folks, feel free to send me your blood pudding recipes and uh, we'll <laughs> figure out who's, you know, if I should pass them on to Ian or not. But uh, could you uh, remind people where to, um, um, they can, how they can contact you, where they can acquire your books? Yes, um, my website is designed as the first point of contact, really. So that's ianproven.ca. Uh, um, the spelling of my names, both of them, is a bit unusual. So you just have to pay attention to that. But you can find there a little bit about who I am and the books I've written. And there's an email contact that uh, will get to me. Uh, that's the best way of doing it, I think. All right. Thank you, Ian, so much for taking this time to talk with me today. It's a great pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. Remember, you can check out Ian's uh, writings and you can contact him through his website. I'll put the description, uh, I'll put it in the description below. It's ianproven.ca. And if you have any questions for me, you want to talk about blood pudding or anything else, you could write me at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. And so until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Mm -hmm.